to talk with Tony. Our guest is Lieutenant Governor Juliana Stratton. Welcome, Juliana. Thank you. Glad to be here, Madam President. You know, our, our, our viewers always are interested in kind of the backstory. So can you tell us, you know, where you grew up, what kind of environment it was? Sure. Well, I was um, born in Chicago uh, on the south side. I primarily lived in Hyde Park or far south side on about 91st Street. And, uh, but there was a little bit of time because my dad was in the Navy that we lived on a farm in Belfair, Washington, in the state of Washington. And uh, I often laugh because, <clears throat> you know, being lieutenant governor and working on issues relating to agriculture, I often talk about I have lived on a farm before, albeit when I was just two years old. Um, but I grew up, uh, went to uh, Kenwood Academy High School, which is a public high school in Hyde Park. Uh, lived in Hyde Park, and then I went off to the University of Illinois at Urbana-Champaign and studied broadcast journalism. I always thought that I would be either a newscaster or news reporter, and I did that for one of the local cable stations with the university while I was there. Uh, came out and started my career with city government. Uh, I was a video producer with the city's Office of Cable Communications, trying to do, um, kind of get city council on to cable television, much like C-SPAN. And my boss at the time was uh, a woman who happened to be an attorney. I didn't really have a lot of attorneys in my family. And so it was the I think first- your, your father was a doctor? My father's a doctor, my mom was a teacher. And, um, and so I didn't see a lot of attorneys in my family. I think I have a knot that's an attorney, but that was really it. And I thought that to be a lawyer, you had to be in the courtroom. And so to go to this governmental agency and see this woman who was a lawyer, uh, she became kind of a mentor of mine, and I decided to go to law school. So I ended up at DePaul University College of Law. And uh, so that's been my career, the very early years of my career. All right, so a, a Southsider, mm -hmm. public schools, yep. and public university, and then, mm -hmm. uh, then to law school. That's right. All right. Your professional life, I know you've been involved in criminal justice issues in a variety of capacities. Why don't sure. you share that? Yeah, so I, while I was in law school, I was trained as a mediator by the Center for Conflict Resolution. And I just fell in love with this process that was bringing people together. You know, in, in court, you fight it out. One person, one party against the other, and you try to see who can win. And I like the idea of com bringing people together to see how you can resolve the problem and maybe preserve the relationship. And so I left the firm that I was with and started my own alternative dispute resolution firm, which I had for over 20 years, uh, doing mediation and arbitration and serving as an administrative judge. Uh, and then I went on to kind of work with a number of different governmental agencies as a mediator uh, until I ended up working for your administration in <laughs> 2011. Um, to lead the Justice Advisory Council. Now, throughout my career, in addition to being a mediator, I also did work in community around juvenile justice reform. I'm a restorative justice practitioner, and so I did a lot of work uh, to really think about what were some of the alternatives to incarceration and how we could build up community to really play a role in helping to solve those issues. And so in coming to the county in 2011, um, that kind of brought my background with juvenile justice, but also in how do you bring people together to try to move an agenda forward. So um, I enjoyed doing that work, and uh, then I went to lead the Center for Public Safety and Justice at the University of Illinois at Chicago. There I trained law enforcement around the country on how to um, build trust with the communities that they served. Community and engagement. Exactly, exactly. And then uh, during that time is when I also ran for um, state representative of the 5th District. Um, that was not my first time running for office, by the way. I ran for local school council at Kenwood Academy, which is the high school that I attended and my older daughters attended, and so um, served on the local school council. But uh, when I was a state representative, I did a, a, a passed a number of bills that related to criminal justice reform and juvenile justice reform. Uh, bills like establishing the first women's correctional, uh, it was the Women's Correctional Services Act that makes sure that women that are incarcerated in Illinois have trauma-informed and gender-responsive services and programming. I passed the bill to end preschool expulsion, which some people don't even realize that three and four-year-olds, disproportionately black and brown, get expelled from preschool. 
And so we passed that bill that you cannot expel, you must find ways to provide supportive services to these young people and their families. And I passed a bill ending school-based booking stations where there were schools in our state where there were rooms to process young people for arrest. And I don't know about you, but when I go to school, I'm not expecting to see a room specifically designed to be arrested in, um, but rather when I was in school, assuming I got in trouble, uh, there were other ways that we... You went to the principal's office. Yeah, you went to the principal's <laughs> office, or you went to the dean's office, or you went to the counselor, but you did not go to a room to get arrested. So that now uh, is, is work. So the work that I've done as a legislator, as well as throughout my career, has primarily been in public service, and that's where I really uh, fell in love with uh, work to really bring more justice to our communities. I, I'm fascinated by, you know, we talk about the school to prison pipeline. The mm -hmm. idea that there's a room in a school for arresting kids is pretty appalling. Well, the other thing that I always say is we do talk about a school to prison pri pipeline, but after my work on preschool expulsion, I say that there's a preschool to prison pipeline, and that's very unfortunate. By the way, students that get expelled in preschool are much more likely to drop out of high school, and as you know from all of the great work that you do, that then makes that pipeline to prison even all the more possible. Yeah. All right. Now the challenge. The challenge came up uh, to run for lieutenant governor. How did that? How did that transpire? Well, so one of the things that I didn't even realize was that it was only seven months into being a state rep that I was at, that the announcement was made that I was going to be then candidate J. B. Pritzker, now Governor J. B. Pritzker's running mate, and. Um, you know, he came to my district, the 5th District, which is a district that was about 14 miles long, um, going from uh, sort of one magnificent mile and sort of that area and 14 miles uh, south to about 79th Street. And it wasn't very wide, but it was also, it was one of the most diverse districts in the state, some of the wealthiest residents of our state and some of the most under-resourced communities. And so, um, then J.B. Pritzker, as a candidate exploring running for, uh, running for governor, he came to meet with me and he just wanted to kind of hear from me about what were some of the challenges of, our, of my district. He wanted to know what were people interested in, what did they want to see happen. And we sat down for breakfast. I admired the fact that he came to my district and wanted to just listen. I think it's important in public service, as we both know, to listen to the people in communities. We, we don't know it all and it's important to engage communities. So he, we talked, we stayed in contact, and um, I kind of said later, maybe there was some kind of aspect of an interview during that meeting. I didn't see that, but we were, we were really just connecting and stayed in contact about the work that he was doing, and he continued to meet with people and listen to people and listen to not just elected officials but other community stakeholders around what was important to move our state forward. So uh, when it came to the point of... Uh, him asking me to be his running mate, it really came down to a question of my saying, you know, I really like what you're doing and I believe that you're the right person to move our state forward and to lead our state. But to do this, I really want to stay involved in something I'm very passionate about and that is criminal justice reform. And if that's something that I can do and, and to have a real r substantive role working on these issues, uh, then I, it would be my honor to be your running mate. And he said, to his credit, I wouldn't have it any other way. You know, I want you to lead these issues. And so that's there how you the, are. That's how it happened. Yeah. All right. Now, what's your what's your kind of portfolio as lieutenant governor? I know it isn't simply the criminal justice reform stuff. It's not just the criminal justice reform stuff, but it is a big part of it. So the governor signed very early on into our administration uh, an executive order creating the Justice, Equity, and Opportunity Initiative. Um, and the JEO is what we call it. It is a way of looking at justice beyond just policing jails and prisons. That's certainly a part of this conversation. But if we don't look at justice around housing and access to education and affordable health care and uh, mental health services and food insecurity and all of in access to employment and, a broader, and jobs. Holistic way. Exactly. We have to think about that. And there are lots of communities all around our state that have suffered decades of disinvestment and really need some help and really need it to need to be lifted up. And the governor and I both believe very strongly that our whole state is lifted up and, and uh, moves forward if we can lift up these communities in particular. So the JEO uh, is really about looking at justice more comprehensively and making sure that we're thinking about um, 
policies and legislation that can really help lift up communities. Um, and then secondly, uh, I, you know, I chair the Illinois Council on Women and Girls, uh, which is a newly created council. We have 22 women serving on the council at the end of this, uh, of 2019. We uh, released a report which will talk about some of the recommendations and people will be hearing more about that very soon. Um, I chair several councils statutorily, such as the Governor's Rural Affairs Council, the Military Economic Development Council, the Illinois Rivers Coordinating Council. And then I also chair the R3 board, which is Restore, Reinvest, and Renew. I believe those are the three <laughs> words. We call it R3. Yeah. Um, and it, this was born out of our um, cannabis, le adult use cannabis legalization uh, legislation which really had a strong social equity focus. And the R3 board is uh, really responsible for investing funds into communities that have been most harmed by the war on drugs. And so um, the money is going to be from 25% of the uh, cannabis tax revenue, 25% of it will be reinvested into communities throughout the state um, that have been harmed by the war on drugs, ha where we've seen disinvestment, and making sure, again, as I've said before, that we can lift up some of those communities as a form, really, of restorative justice. So the cannabis legislation kind of is legalization, it's <clears throat> expungement, and then it's efforts to uh, address the social equity component of Absolutely. it. Absolutely. And, and the R3 is part of the addressing the social equity. R3 is part of addressing, and first of all, let me just say that um, there have been a number of people throughout the for several years who have been working on this getting this to this day where we could see an end of prohibition of cannabis in Illinois and see the legalization of adult use cannabis we've had the uh, medical uh, cannabis over the last five years in this state um, it was a very homogeneous group we did not see the kind of diversity that we should see that represents the entire state and so we're working to rectify it was that. national firms that were White folks. Yeah, so we're, <laughs> we're, we're, we're working, talking about this in racial terms. Yeah, yes. and, and we're working to, to bring some more diversity to this industry, and that was very important to the governor, very important to the bill sponsors and the, the members of the General Assembly, and, um, and all of the advocates and organizers who have been working on this issue for a number of years. So we have the R3 that I talked about, that's important, but we also have to and make that's sure... that's money that, that, that comes to the state in the form of taxes, and a quarter of it is set aside. That's right. Okay. For community reinvestment, and I chair the R3 board, and it's under our Justice, Equity, and Opportunity Initiative, working with and in conjunction with our ICJA, Illinois Criminal Justice Information Authority. Um, the second area that I guess I would talk about is, which is so important, is the expungement piece. Um, you know that the governor on uh, December 31st pardoned 11,017. Uh, record, you know, individuals who had records uh, related to cannabis, and that was a big start. But under this legislation, there are hundreds of thousands of people that will be el eligible. And we know that state's attorney Kim Fox, for example, has done a great job of pushing that and making sure that here in Cook County, that people are getting their records expunged. But this is something that all throughout the state, up to 770,000 people eligible to get their records expunged for uh, cannabis-related uh, offenses. And um, so that's important from a criminal justice standpoint. And then I will say that we also want to make sure that we're opening up the doors of opportunity for entrepreneurs and licensing and others. And so this is a very slow and deliberate rollout. You know, people saw January 1st was the beginning, uh, really the end of prohibition, the beginning of legalization, but this industry to turn it around and to bring the kind of equity that we want to see as now the 11th state to um, to legalize adult use cannabis in this country, um, it has to be a very slow and methodical process. And so for those who got the initial licenses, uh, the money that they are you that they put into these licenses will help seed some of our social equity licenses and making sure that there's money available so that people can get into this business from some of these communities that historically have been locked out. Well, you know, I'm, I'm very grateful for the work that the state has done and of course passing this legislation. In our budget for 2020 in the mm -hmm. county, we added staff to the clerk's office, the clerk of the court, and to the yeah. state's attorney's office so that we would have people in place to do the work of expungement because we've got tens of thousands of people in Cook County alone who Absolutely. are eligible for expungement. Absolutely. And as we both know, I mean, the expungement is important because 
um, we want to make sure that people who have been harmed throughout, you know, uh, throughout history and throughout the sort of war on cannabis that we saw. War on which, drugs, yeah. Exactly. And, but what we really saw is that we saw black and brown people utilizing or possessing or utilizing cannabis at the same rates as whites, but we saw the arrest rates being much higher and disproportionately higher, sometimes by three and four times as much for black and brown communities. And so this is a way when we talk about social equity and when we talk about justice, equity, and opportunity, this is a way to kind of say, those folks should not have the barriers to employment and housing and educational opportunities that came from something that where they were disproportionately criminalized. Yeah, I, what I've read I think is that eight percent of whatever tribe you want to talk about, white folks, black folks, Latinx community, whatever, mm -hmm. it's about eight percent of mm -hmm. the folks use illicit drugs. It's just that if you come into our courtrooms and That's see right. who comes before judges with possession charges, That's right. it's, it's disproportionately black and brown young men. Exactly. And so this is one of the ways that we're trying to bring some level of equity where we say we have to focus on those communities to build them up. And then we also have to focus on making sure that we clear the records and allowing a pathway into the industry, not just as employers, but as owners, as operators, as entrepreneurs in every level of this industry. Uh, to come back to the R3 resources for a minute, how have you prioritized the money you hope to expend, to spend? So uh, it will be in a couple of different areas. And first of all, let me just also say that we are focused on equity in, even in this R3 process. Um, so w there will be an RFP process or a notice of funding opportunity that will go out to communities. Um, but what often happens when those sorts of opportunities are available, communities, first of all, you get this packet of information, it's very complex, it's complicated, there's all these things you have to do. And a lot of organizations that are doing great work in communities um, you know, it's hard don't to don't have understand. the capacity to do yeah. the application. You don't understand the capacity. You don't know what it says and what it's requiring. So we're going to do make sure that the language is very accessible. That's a that's a form of equity. We're going to make sure that as people are reviewing these applications, that we have a diverse group that's going to be reviewing the applications, and we're going to make sure that um, that organizations get technical assistance to do this work, and so to make sure that they can get in applications that will be considered. Um, but we're going to be looking at everything from re-entry work, we're going to be looking at uh, legal services, all sorts of violence reduction efforts. These are the kinds of things that we think are going to help these communities become stronger um, because as I said from the very beginning that when we see these communities that have suffered so much disinvestment continue to be built up and entrepreneurs have opportunity, this is going to benefit the whole state. Lieutenant Governor, we're very grateful that you were w willing to join us today, and we look forward to hearing from you as, as you implement the R3 initiatives. Thank you, and thanks for having me. We really appreciate it. So thank you for rejoining us for Talk with Tony. Uh, this is one of my all-time favorite books. It's called Parting the Waters, America in the King Years, 1954 to 1963. It's the first volume of a three-volume biography of Martin Luther King by Taylor Branch. Uh, you know, this is, as I said, one of my favorite books. It's not just about Martin Luther King, really. It's a, it's a panoramic view of the civil rights movement, and it's just absolutely fascinating. So although it's um, quite thick, <laughs> and I know that's off-putting for some of you, I encourage you to read it. It's extraordinarily well-written, and it's a fascinating look at the civil rights movement in the 50s and 60s. Try it. Welcome back to Talk with Tony. Our next guest is John Yonan, who heads up the Department of Transportation and Highways for the county. Thank you, John. Thank you. All right, now, yes. tell us a little bit about uh, your personal story. Sure. Um, sure. So, um, lifelong Chicagoan that just enjoyed playing with dirt and mud <laughs> as a kid. And when folks talked about a future and a career or something that I needed to take serious, um, I thought engineering was something that I wanted to pursue and pursued civil engineering. Um, now, what's a, a civil engineer? Depth. So, you know, that's yeah, like a, a there's good a civil term. engineer, a physical engineer. Mechanical engineers, electrical, so many other aspects of, of how they want to define engineering. But generally, civil has to do with parts of environmental, structural, geotechnical, fluids, um, and transportation. And so that's where in school you get a general degree. 
and then you go out into the working world. And so as a lifelong Chicagoan, product of the Chicago Public Schools, um, I came back home and had my first opportunity, my first job. Um, always wanted to be in the public sector and the city of Chicago um, was looking to hire their first entry level engineer in a decade and just happened to put that application in right place, right time. Uh, the city just had uh, revamped their public works group and created the Chicago Department of Transportation. And in 1993 is when I started my career. Okay. Uh, spent 19 years there, which I think coincided with uh, my the terms that Alderman, you were yes. as alderman. And right. uh, it really enjoyed working with the fourth you know, ward and, and the opportunities we had on the Lakeshore Drive pedestrian bridge competition, uh, which um, you put some great leadership in place with the Park District, Shirley Newsom from your group that uh, helped come up with four design schemes, um, two of them that have been built um, over at 35th Street and at 43rd Street, some really great bridges, um, and the other two that are in the design and concept phase. Um, but uh, there were other projects in the fourth ward that we had the privilege to work on together with, including a couple of those bridges over the IC uh, Railroad at Oakwood and then Lakeshore Drive, which is another project. So um, all of those great projects and the, uh, the job that I had in 1993, I started as an entry level and took every step up to the chief engineer of the Department of Transportation. Um, and as great as the time that we had and the projects that were there, um, that uh, the opportunity to then come over here to the county that you, the chief of staff, Kurt Summers at the time presented me. Um, I wasn't looking to be a department head. I wasn't looking to go anywhere else, do anything different. Uh, there were so many great things that we accomplished at the city. Um, but your desire to say, here is an opportunity to do transportation different. I'm looking to do something different. I don't know what that is. Empowered me in those interview processes to uh, just come on and, and, and look at a career change and look at the county unit of government as an opportunity to be able to work and invest in communities. 50 wards is a, you know, a big deal. And, but but the, 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 the roadway, the infrastructure in Chicago, it's built out. Um, there's you know, certain aldermen that you need to work closely with, but the opportunity here at the county to work with so many of the agencies, 134 municipalities, uh, was something that I couldn't even have dreamed it would be as great as it's been. But um, back then I made the decision to come over here and uh, just celebrated my eighth year. All right, and, uh, we're it's glad to have you. It's been a great experience, <laughs> so I'm glad to be here, Madam President. Well, now you, you yeah. had the responsibility of yeah. uh, putting together our first uh, long-range transportation plan in 70 years. So That's tell us correct. a little bit about I, Yes, so that, that, that was the first thing that uh, we had heard. Again, the, uh, the discussions that you had about how many highways the you know, Cook County Highway Department was responsible for. And when they told you none, um, it didn't make any sense and that we needed to look at transportation in a different way. And so, um, as you said, you know, we uh, went back to find what was the last time we did true transportation, highway long range planning. And what's happened in our industry is that a lot of work was done in the 30s through the 60s to build infrastructure. And the time in my career right now, everything is rebuilding what has come to the end of its useful life. And you said, let's be more visionary in our long range plan. Let's look at not ways that in, in this region we're gonna ever rebuild our infrastructure to ease congestion, but if we really look at not just projects, but at policies on how we can do transportation different, you gave us a, a, a clean slate to go and do transportation planning in a different way. So uh, a three-year effort um, with a number of agencies that were part of our program and our transportation committee uh, was convened. Uh, we didn't want the technocrats, the other engineers, and, and, and the typical planners that were part of our committee, but we brought in some of the non-for-profits. We brought in some uh, folks that really understood the policies of transportation instead of how projects get implemented and came up with our long-range transportation plan in 2016 and that long-range transportation plan focused on not projects as I said earlier but on five policy priorities and those policy priorities then became the blueprint that this now became and and has been now for 
<coughs> almost five years, a blueprint of how transportation should be done differently. And in this region, there has been so many folks who have spoken so highly of how these policy priorities now get to be implemented in a way that is really transportation in the modern era. So these policy priorities then allowed us to really focus on how we could strategically align some of the investments. Uh, now keep in mind, I talk about my almost 28 year career here, and in that time period, there had been various state capital bills, federal transportation bills, but I will tell you that there has never been a sustainable funding in transportation that has ever been a part of these capital bills because the cost of infrastructure, uh, the cost of kicking the can on just rehabilitating projects had become so enormous. Um, but with your effort in Springfield this previous year, I could really say that we've been able to get to a point where sustainable funding has been identified in this industry. So now, where do we go when we make our investments? We go back to our blueprint, our long-range transportation plan that, again, isn't picking projects, but setting our number one policy priority, which is transit, as our number one area where we want to align some of our investments. Our number two policy priority, which is freight, uh, this region being an area that is the uh, freight capital of North America. Uh, not only freight as is to like the infrastructure aspect of it, but freight as the job creating opportunities that are here. There are more jobs created and, and, and very um, high paying jobs in the freight industry. So to be able to look at freight from the lens of job and economic opportunities is where we've made that policy and those investments in freight a priority. And uh, again, thanks to your leadership, uh, the CREATE program, which when you were older woman, uh, past the city of Chicago, the state of Illinois, and the railroads um, coming together and being create partners. Uh, but when you came over to be board president, Cook County was not at the table. And because Cook County wasn't at the table, we weren't being able to guide some of our investments in the freight industry until we looked at the opportunities that some of the federal grants were starting to be able to make some of those freight projects priorities and you had us up front putting together a grant application for the federal government to fund the most expensive crate project to date. Uh, Crate's been around since around 2003, and we were able to cobble together some local funding for this project that made one of the strongest applications that the Crate partners had put forward. With our 77 and almost $78 million investment, uh, we were able to bring back a project with some of the partners totaling almost a half billion dollars. And so with our second this is policy- This decongestion uh, effort. So, uh, yes, uh, that's correct. So the 75th Freight Street and, mm -hmm. and and Amtrak and and our own Metra and our own yes passenger rail uh, locally with Metra and so the 75th Street corridor improvement project is a number of different projects, but the first phase of this actually creates a flyover of rail over rail that uh, will really um, unbundle some of the congestion that's at this intersection, which uh, again is, is, is a project that's been uh, identified as, as, as nationally a freight bottleneck. Um, All right, so we've, so talked, we've talked a little bit about rail and how important that is. It's yes. important to our local economy, and of course it's important in terms of decongesting our our region as a rail hub. Yes. Can you talk real quickly about our, our fair transit initiative, of yeah. the public transit yes. part of our long range plan? So I did, um, yes, uh, talk about how our number one policy priority is transit, um, but then I gave an example of our number two policy priority in our 75th Street corridor improvement. But I did that because what really we were able to demonstrate in that is that Cook County wants to be a leader in the transportation industry, is willing to put their investments on the table and when we looked at transit, we said all along, if we were going to make that our number one policy priority, we're not responsible for any buses, any trains. We're in the transit you know, world. Can we actually make a difference? And so we went and uh, looked at the Southland as a area that we knew was underserved when it came to transit and did a basic uh, 
pilot of where we can actually look to do some of the mismatch of where folks who are dependent on transit are not able to use the transit that's available to them. And the Southland is an area that really popped on our map to show where we know that transit is serving uh, the Metro Electric and the Rock Island line. Um, and as it comes into the city and into Millennium Park and at the LaSalle Street Station, that there was ridership decline in these two metro lines. And in fact, those two lines are the ones that are losing more riders than the entire metro system. And because of that, there was an opportunity for us to take a leadership role like we did on the CREATE program and offer to do a three-year demonstration where we were going to look at the fare structure. And if we were to tweak it, we modeled ways that some of the passenger shifts that currently are using transit, but transit that has not been made convenient to some of the riders. I had mentioned in the south suburbs, there's folks who are actually boarding a pace bus going underneath the, in many cases, the Rock Island and the Metra electric stations um, at 147th Street and going to the Harvey Intermodal Station, getting on another bus to take them all the way to 95th Street to get on the red line. So in many instances, they've passed by these metro stations because of the cost of what it is to ride metro has been prohibitive for some of these riders to be able to take advantage of getting to downtown, saving 20 to 30 minutes of their commute time. So <clears throat> having identified that the need was there, this year, again, under your leadership, uh, we have put together a proposal, a three-year demonstration, where we want to offer an integrated fare card system first off so that you can use PACE, Metro, and CTA with a one fare card system. Then we wanted to look at what the Metro fares were in the city of Chicago at these various stations and make them equivalent to what the CTA rail or bus would cost the patrons um, using uh, the, uh, the Metra instead of the CTA. And then outside the city of Chicago in Southern Cook on the Metro Electric in the Rock Island, look to reshuffle the zone costs of the different stations so that in Riverdale and in parts of Blue Island, the zones would go currently that are zone D to zone A, which is the first station that you would have outside of the downtown area, basically right outside the city of Chicago. And so those uh, costs of what Metra would then, we believe, be able to grow the Metra ridership on those two lines. And more importantly, as I said, the fare integration system would allow us to have our third part of this demonstration, and that is a free transfer opportunity. Uh, we know not everybody works downtown. Uh, we know the second job generating uh, uh, area in the Chicagoland area is around O'Hare, Elk Grove Village. And because now we know that uh, some of the folks are using uh, the CTA system because they can get on the blue line and go out to O'Hare if they're coming from as far as Harvey. But with this fair demonstration, we're able to now allow them to take Metra, transfer free to the CTA system, and go to places like the West Loop on the Green Line or the Blue Line out to the O'Hare and Rosemont area. So this truly has been something that um, the, the area, it's, it's, it's not a new idea, but has been really you know, invigorated with the leadership that you're willing to demonstrate in this. And the leadership, of course, comes with a financial backstop on what this might do to the type of ridership that one transit agency may be experiencing to the gain of another, or possibly maybe not even a, 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 a gain in ridership, but that financially this is the right thing in the world of, of where we're looking in the Southland, where we know equity is an issue that can provide at least some transit opportunities for folks. And uh, that has been, uh, in, in this area, in, in, in 2020, something that we're gonna be hearing a lot of folks talk about your leadership in this area that we're very excited about. Well, thank you, John. Yeah. We look forward to hearing, you know, what, what's happening in the 75th Street corridor in terms yes. of freight and, yep. and the fair transit demonstration. We'll have yes. you back. Okay? Thank you. I will be back. All thank right. You, thank you for joining us for Talk with Tony.